enslaved society. Uh, just a quick note, I jump back and forth between using the term slave and enslaved. You can use either. I don't count off points like one way or another or anything. Um, it's just I really want to drive home the point that these people did not like choose to be in this position in society. And so they are enslaved. They are forced into this position constantly. So I just that's why I use these terms. So looking at um, enslaved life and culture, we are going to see during the 1800s more births rather than deaths of those who were enslaved. Now there is some smuggling in of enslaved people into the United States, but generally not. So really, by the time you get to like 1850, almost all that are enslaved were considered African Americans, not Africans because they had shared in this common fate of bondage and they had generally been born within the United States and therefore had a different identity than their predecessors. And um, that being said, they are going to manage to retain dignity in the face of just continual humiliation and they're going to really rely on their family life as well as religious beliefs as basically their source of strength in these just extremely intolerable circumstances. So first of all, you have slave codes, and we've looked at this before. Slave codes were a series of laws that were passed mainly in the southern colonies, starting back in like the uh, late 17th century and then the early 18th century. And this was very much defending the status of slaves and codifying the basic denial of, he of like civil rights to them. These codes are basically going to give those who own slaves near absolute power over their human property. So um, some examples of slave codes. Slaves could not own property. They could not make contracts. They could not possess guns. They could not possess alcohol. They couldn't uh, legally marry most of the time. There's a few exceptions in certain places. Uh, they could not testify against their master or any white person in a court of law. Um, many slave codes would prohibit teaching a slave how to read or write. Um, they could not leave a plantation without like their owner's written permission. Um, the thing is, any kind of challenge to the master's authority or infraction of like plantation rules would end up with the enslaved being punished. And the most common used punishment was whippings. However, if a um, enslaved person was to strike a master, commit arson, or conspire to rebel, that would be punishable by death. Now, could a master outright murder their slave? Well, that tended to be illegal, but it also tended to be overlooked if it happened that like a disobedient enslaved person was killed while being disciplined. Now that being said, most masters saw it as, you know, good business to feed, clothe, and house their enslaved property well enough to ensure two things. First of all, they wanted to ensure productive labor, but also they wanted to ensure like family life so that there would be reproduction and thus giving them future enslaved people. Rarely though, would these masters provide slaves with more than the bare necessities. They generally lived off of rations of like cornmeal and salt pork. They might supplement this diet with, you know, some vegetable vegetables that they grew on the side if the planter like permitted them to. What this generally means is for the enslaved population, they might have ample calories, but they're not having enough vitamins and nutrients that could have helped protect them against diseases. And so things like beriberi, plegra, intestinal disorders, dysentery, and cholera were actually fairly common. And in fact, the life expectancy of an enslaved was 21 to 22 years, which is only about half of the white life expectancy at this time. Generally, they also owned only two sets of clothes, one for the summer and one for the winter, and they would be housed in 15 by 15 one foot, I'm sorry, 15 by 15 feet one room cabins 
and yet five or six people would live there. Generally, these were nothing more than like a basic shelter against the elements. Uh, generally, you also see some individuality though between the difference with like handmade beds, benches, and sometimes even, you know, different ar architectural elements. The thing is, if you looked at an enslaved person and you compared them to a more typical free white person at this time, diet and housing was generally around the same as a poor white person, but the workload for a slave was so much worse. Um, very much fear of being punished and thus being whipped is going to keep slaves at their work. That being said, about 15 to 20% of like plantation slaves were actually like house servants or like skilled artisans. And a lot of times these jobs were a bit lighter and a little less regimented. And so a lot of times plantations would have like incentive programs to get these jobs or incentive programs for other things like time off on a weekend, um, a pass to visit a spouse on another plantation the right to have a garden plot. Now, a lot of these things, while initially started off as like a privilege, a lot of enslaved people came to see them as like customary rights. And if they were taken away from an enslaved, then their morale would decline and work routines might be interrupted. About three fourths of all enslaved people worked on plantations or medium sized farms. And then of course there was family the core institution of slave life. The thing is, enslaved people face so many obstacles, but still their marriages could produce endearing commitments and a really supportive moral code for family members. Oftentimes, like when it came to marriage, even though it wasn't necessarily recognized formally, um, it would be that this marriage would re remain intact until death or more frequently the sale of one of the spouses. In fact, one third of enslaved marriages were broken up by sales or forced removals. And you see gender roles even within enslaved society. So for instance, um, an enslaved father might hunt or fish on the side to try to help feed his family and oftentimes would risk beatings or even death when they tried to defend their wives against the sexual abuse and rape from overseers or masters. Whereas an enslaved mother had to go through the burdens of pregnancy, childcare, laundry, cooking. Even enslaved children who oftentimes would be sold had to be taught very early in their life skills of survival. And their skills of survival included things like hiding one's true feelings from white people and telling white people what they wanted to hear. Also, religion was very important to enslaved people. A lot of times they relied on expressive forms of worship. A lot of times participants would, you know, shout and sway. In fact, no more than about 20% of enslaved ever converted formally to Christianity. If they did, they would find meaning though in like stories from the Bible, like the liberation of Moses's people. Oftentimes, if they did convert, they favored, um, different denominations like Baptists or Methodists rather than, you know, something that was um, more formal in its doctrine or more organized because this let slaves basically have more leeway to choose their own preachers and engage in more of a physical call and response pattern of worship. Now that being said, just like every single other aspect of an enslaved person's life, planters were really pragmatic about controlling their enslaved population's religion. And so they did generally encourage Christianity amongst the enslaved. Um, but they were also really concerned about abolitionist propaganda. And so really they're gonna preach their own version of Christianity that of course really would emphasize passivity and obedience. Of course, enslaved the enslaved would often see through this and recognize it as hypocritical and recognize that the sermons of white ministers were propaganda on some level. 
And so uh, they might attend these kinds of services in the mornings, but a lot of times the enslaved at night might hold their own services and hide their own religious beliefs from white people, just like so many other aspects of their lives. And then, of course, there is resistance. Resistance really was futile. A disobedient slave oftentimes would just be sold to a harsher master or outright killed or killed accidentally while being punished. Still, there are four major uprisings during the 19th century. So this is looking at those 1800s leading up to the Civil War. The first was G Gabriel Prosser's rebellion in 1800. It's about like 50 armed slaves around Richmond, Virginia. The rebels though, while they tried to self-emancipate themselves here, they failed to seize a key war road to Richmond and basically another enslaved enslaved person basically informed on them and warned white authorities. And this basically doomed the rebellion before it could really get underway. In the end, uh, Gabriel Prosser himself was executed as well as 25 others. And I want you to think, as I go through all these rebellions, I want you to look for those key themes. What happens multiple times in these rebellions? What are the consequences? What are themes that come? Uh, the second um, happened about a decade later in 1810. It was known as the German Coast Uprising. Uh, this is right, it was actually north of New Orleans, um, and it actually included, it's something like somewhere between 200 and 300 enslaved people actually got involved. And amazingly enough, even though this is the largest enslaved uprising, they actually only killed uh, two white men during it. However, the rebels were caught in the process Oftentimes they were killed immediately or even tortured immediately trying to be a warning to others who might be in the surrounding area. It's something like more than 60 enslaved died and their heads then were posted on poles along the Mississippi River basically to warn other enslaved people of the fate that awaited rebellious slaves. The third uprising was Denmark Vesey's conspiracy, and it fails before it even started. Um, this was in Charleston, and so it's in South um, Carolina. Basically, uh, Denmark Vesey had actually managed to purchase his freedom and then planned this revolt for the summer of 1822. However, the entire plot collapsed when two domestic servants basically betrayed it. 35 conspirators would be hung, including Vesey, and then another 37 would be banished from the state. The fourth one is Nat Turner's Rebellion, and really this is probably the most famous of all of these. Um, the thing is, a lot of these that we've been looking at, they were in the lower south, where slavery is a lot more entrenched. And so there was this really belief that, like in Virginia, that, oh, that's because those slave owners don't actually treat their slaves right, whereas we treat them fairly, even though that was a very small minority that did so. And so it was a really big shock when Nat Turner's Rebellion broke out because it did erupt before it could be suppressed, and it was in Virginia. Nat Turner himself led a small band of followers on a murderous rampage in 1831. They killed indiscriminately men, women, and children. Um, but in the end, Turner's party was captured and many of them were killed. And in fact, a lot of people who were involved were killed as well because basically uh, surrounding counties heard of the uprising in like, outsiders would come you know barreling into the county and if they met like a black person on the road on the way there they just assumed they were part of the conspiracy and outright killed them and so um turner actually managed to escape for a while and it's really fascinating because even though they killed a lot of people nat turner himself only i think killed one person in this uprising um turner escaped then for a time and was hidden away but he was eventually found out and um it's something like Turner and more than 30 other slaves would be executed. But like I said, panicky white people killed 
probably in total around a hundred black people during this time in total. The thing is looking at all this enslaved, the enslaved really understood the odds against, the odds were against a successful rebellion. It was extremely difficult. And like I said, we don't see a successful slave rebellion in the United States ever. There's only one in this class and we talked about that and that's in Haiti and that's not in the United States. Where we see more and more resistance is in other ways. For instance, self-emancipation, running away. Uh, the Underground Railroad was famously, uh, was very famous for providing some assistance in this, but they only actually helped about a thousand individuals escape every year. Running away generally was a common way of resistance, but generally they ran away to nearby swamps and woods, and most of the time they were, vo they either voluntarily returned or were tracked down by like bloodhounds within a week. A lot of times when one ran away, it was more about visiting like a spouse or a loved one, and generally they were severely punished. So many enslaved would resist in less overt ways. They might mock people by, you know, making up folk tales like Briar Rabbit, where a weak but wily animal cunningly outsmarted their stronger enemies. Um, they might malinger at work. They might um, abuse farm animals. They might lose or break tools or steal food. And then, of course, there's like committing arson. So looking at all of this, this is actually uh, one of your big discussion topics going on. Um, I want you to find a modern day song. So like I define that here as like 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, 2000s, you know, later kind of thing. Please don't go back and find something from 1920. Like, please keep modern, basically. And I want you to explain how its lyrics can be identified with slavery. Now, you don't have to do all these examples. I give you a bunch of examples here from the um, song I chose. Um, I chose Johnny Cash's version of Hurt. And so like I explained here, I hurt myself today to see if I can, if I still feel. And I wrote, I feel like this would be something a slave might do since their life is so hard, I can imagine them becoming numb to it. And so like, that's all you would need to do. But then I give you a lot of different examples here that I would definitely encourage you read through. Um, another part of your discussion actually is going in and then looking at another person's song and binding a lyric from their song and identifying it with slavery as well. So don't like do all of your entire song. <laughs> do like one verse or one section of it so that somebody else can go in and maybe interpret a different section of it. But it's a lot of fun to look at what other people's songs people have come up with. I've had people find songs in like Spanish when doing this before. I've, it, I've had rap songs. I've had pop songs. So find like, especially if you know, like if you have a genre of music you really enjoy, find a song. I guarantee you can find something that you could in some way identify with slavery.